Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love. And also remember to set your notification bell to all. That way you know every time I upload, which tends to be daily. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and while I'm thinking of it, I never exclude anyone in my audience here on Back to Ashes. Happy Pride Month to the LGBTQIA plus community. Be who you is, be who you are, because your spirit will never stray far. Enjoy. Hello guys. So, we went for a hike with my boyfriend for his birthday today. We're not very superstitious people, but we were quite anxious the entire time. We didn't meet anyone on the road, and I was just feeling weird. Like I was thinking, I know we're going to meet someone, but that someone I wasn't chill about. My boyfriend was a bit nervous, which is unusual for him, as he's very used to hiking pretty much anywhere. All right, so we were four plus hours into the hike, and we reached almost the end. There was some sort of cabin in the forest, and a guy looking like Tom Hanks and Castaway. That I swear to God to. He jumped out of his cabin, naked with a knife, and began to make grunts. I told my boyfriend that he has a knife, and the guy starts running towards us. My boyfriend told me to run. Go now. And I tried to do my best, as I'm not the most sporty kind of girl. I believe I fell a few times because I have a lot of scratches and a bump on my shin, but I didn't feel it in the moment. After what felt like forever to run to escape him, we succeeded to find a way out into the neighborhood and then a road. We felt so much relief at that moment. My question is, we feel in shock and pretty traumatized by this whole situation. Do you feel like it's a serious event, or is it not that big of a deal? I know that it might sound stupid to ask, but we just don't know anymore. Maybe we're overreacting? We did report him to the police, by the way, and they are supposed to go to the place, and we're not sure they are going to take their time just for that. So, this happened maybe 15 minutes ago. Here's some backstory. As of four months ago, my wife and I live in a certain metropolitan city of the southeast coast of the USA. We will call it our city. She has been a native all of her life, and I a native 500 kilometers north. We have eaten out downtown for special occasions like our six-month anniversary a few months ago. One of these restaurants is a fancy Thai one we tried on a whim, and it was amazing. I run a small catering business that cooks specifically to teenagers with stage 2 outpatient anorexia and their parents. It's a tiny niche of a place I'm proud of, and the backstory behind that is relatively odd. On to the meat and potatoes. Now, this weekend, I'm up in Philadelphia by myself, attending my cousin's wedding as my wife had to cancel at the last minute. All went well, plenty of drinking, dancing, and pizza the size of my head. I walk into Penn Station just now and go get a sandwich to eat on the train. I sit down and am about to unwrap it when a guy comes up to me. 
five foot nine, maybe ninety pounds soaking wet, and has the stereotypical shaved head with a beard. He gives me the impression of a generic traveler and something I can't quite figure out, giving me creepy vibes all around. A messenger bag over his shoulder, he asks, You're going to our city? To which I'm caught off guard and answer in the affirmative. This was my first mistake. He asks about my work, and I tell him short answers in an effort to get him to get bored with me. Nothing seems to work. He really wants to get to know me. Keep in mind, I don't have any friends or acquaintances who are like this, any family members who have this personality, and I've never met this man in my life, as far as I can tell. Finally, he asks if I like cooking, and I say yes. I tell him about my business, and he asks if I've ever been to a restaurant. I ask him, Yes, it was amazing. The wife and I went there a few months ago. This was my second mistake. Now, I get excited by talking food with anyone, whether it's cooking or eating or dreaming about food designs, flavors, or the ways in which good food and teas can be medicine and help you feel wonderful after a long day or relax you when you can't sleep or get you ready for the day or slow time for enjoyment during a break. I ended up getting worked up for about 15 minutes just talking. Looking back, it seemed like he was reading my body language and reactions while nervously looking around the station as if trying to see who else was listening. When he says, You don't remember me. We met at the restaurant. I squint as he says this in confusion, because it was only myself and my wife that night. I'm thinking that maybe it was our server, but how would the server remember me months later in a different city? He stops me to tell me this, and I realize that even though we have never chatted for this long, I still feel sick talking to him. He comments that the food scene in our city has been up and coming. He tells me his name four times slowly and parses out the syllables. He looks over at the police officers walking around and says in a low tone and a smirk, It was good to meet you. He then walks towards the food court and tells back, I'll see you on the train. Now there's nothing on my clothing or bag that indicates that I live in our city or work there. All of my things still have the logos of my previous jobs or places I've volunteered at. As I walk onto the platform, I'm trying to hide from him. I don't think I don't want this guy to sit next to me for 10 plus hours. I don't even know if he's on the train now, and I hope not to find out. I'll post an update if necessary. Possible con artist and all-around creepy dude... Let's never meet again. All right, dear listeners, this next story is actually three parts. I'm just going to read it all the way through. Here we go. So I have never told anyone this story, though I have other stories I've buried deep until recently, but this is happening right now in the present. I have had people stalk and follow me before, and because of that and my true crime addiction, I've become supremely paranoid and a solid curtain twitcher. I, a 31-year-old female, reside in an upstairs room that was my first room to myself as a child. I had to leave a bad situation and therefore ended up back in my childhood home. For reference, when our walls were built, we were told that the field to our left, with horses and a barn at the time, would one day soon be developed. It was 2000 when we were told that, and it wasn't until 2022 that roads started being formed and foundations laid. I'd already had someone follow me home before, when I was young, but I was in a different bedroom next door. My parents put in a free library that was right below my window, 
and nighttime security lights that are very bright and turn on if you're within like 20 feet of the side of my house my room is on. I'll admit, having an open field next to me so long made me accustomed to not closing the curtains when I change because there was never anyone to watch. Now there is. For the past two weeks, the burglar lights next to the free library had been going off late at night. Because my one side of the curtain is open so I can use my vape, that's the only reason I noticed at all. I didn't think too much at first. We lock all the doors and windows every single night, and I'm on the second floor. I also always looked out to see if it was a car someone walking their dog or a deer, only to see nothing. To add, they put in a shit ton of street lights around this area, so visibility is now great. But it just kept happening. So, last night, I did my usual, and I saw the lights come on out of my peripherals. I acted normal, giving full view out the window. I was going to bed, it was about 3 a.m., turning the TV off, closing the window and curtains, turning the light out. Then I dug down, peering through the curtains to the sidewalk below. I honestly thought I was going to pass out when after a few minutes, maybe five, someone comes out from the side of my house, all silhouette, dressed in black. They kept their back to me until the light turned off, but I swear I could see them standing there, looking up like they could see me. I called the police, but while I was on the phone with the operator, I saw him run off. There wasn't much they could do, except say they'd have a car drive around and look. My parents are asleep, and I know I have to tell them tomorrow. This scares the shit out of me. If it hadn't been happening for weeks and was a solo incident, I would probably be fine about it. But the fact that the light has been going off without me seeing activity and what happened tonight makes me think this person has been watching me and watching my house. To the person outside my window, let's please never fucking meet. Here's a small update. I did tell my parents, and at first they brushed me off, claiming I had a couple drinks and it was late, so I probably just saw someone checking out the library. I then had another conversation about it with just my dad, who said that there had been reports the last couple of weeks of car break-ins, and since my car is parked on my side of the street, right outside my window, maybe they were trying to break into it. I pointed out that, if he was trying to get into my car, why was he pressed up against the house where he was invisible from my window? And why did he at no point go toward my car? I think I freaked him out enough that we are going to potentially get a camera for that area. Given all the development happening around us, I think it's smart enough, even without this incident. So I'm not sure if this is relevant to the story about the person watching through my window and banging on my garage with a crowbar, but I'm worried that everything may be connected somehow. A week ago from this last Saturday, I was supposed to meet with a man who had contacted me through social media with friends in common. It wasn't an obvious date, more like a pre-date if you will. We didn't get there though, as he randomly blocked me out of nowhere, and then unblocked and apologized, thinking everything was normal and we were hanging out. When I didn't respond at all, seeing some major red flags in his behavior, he reached out to tell me I had thin skin for not just going along with it and meeting him in a debatably isolated place. I brushed it off, only to get a message from a different man, seemingly unconnected, blatantly asking for a date exactly a week later. I asked him up front, and kind of rudely, why did he reached out and wanted to date me, because he was seemingly unfazed. 
We seem to have a lot in common, and we're supposed to meet tonight. Here's where it gets really weird. I asked him if we should meet at 6 in a particular spot. He saw it, but said nothing. I figure since he was at work, he was busy. But then, nothing all day. And when I checked in again, he saw it after we were supposed to meet, and still, nothing. He pursued me, just as the last guy. But this time made me more nervous because it feels like he wanted to make sure I was at a certain place at a certain time. For the record, it is a public place, but also very dark in the parking lot and somewhat rural. I didn't think much of it at the time as it's a place I've gone all my life, but it feels like something is going on here. These two men were not reaching out through a dating app. I'm not on any yet, as I wasn't sure about being ready to date again and wanted to let things happen or not happen organically. They found me through social media. Maybe it's not connected, but commenters pointed out how easy it is to find someone's address through social media and these last two men reached out in such a way, acting in such a way, in so close a time, makes me wonder. Maybe my window watcher, garage door banger is separate. Hell, maybe even those are two separate people. I'm not sure what's scarier, but I'm thinking it's scarier if all of this is somehow connected, as my gut tells me. I just don't believe in coincidences, and all of these things happening at the same time is so suspicious to me. I'll just continue going to my gun handling and safety courses, and I start Muay Thai next month, so there is that. Hope this wasn't a boring update. I really feel a bad feeling about these two guys, and even if they aren't connected, I hope we don't meet. Oh, and by the way, we have added four exterior cameras. Bad news, my mom lost her keys. They have an air tag and police have made several attempts to retrieve them unsuccessfully. We don't always know the location. We have all been keeping bedroom doors locked and there are no extra keys in the main areas of these bedrooms, but it's still very scary. Having the whole house re-keyed and my mom has been using my dad's car since she goes to the neighborhood they're in for work. So yay on top of these weird anxiety inducing incidents. Someone out there also has keys to my house. I honestly wish I wasn't writing this right now. I've had weeks of peace with only the ping of my overactive camera system alerting me to people passing by with their dogs or children. I thought everything was fine and maybe this isn't the most dramatic update, but it was just another scary trick marked to add to the list. I got an alert to activity outside the garage. Given my garage door crowbar banger, that's the last one I always pay most attention to honestly. I keep weird hours and hadn't been on my phone, so my first thought, my dad was leaving for work. Then, I saw the recording it made instant later. This man walked boldly up to the car in the driveway, my mom's at the moment, and tried the handles of the car before running off. I called the police with a good description and told them, I have it on video, but my town doesn't have a large police force, and some of them are just like in any department. Shady and lazy as hell. I've rewatched it so many times now, and he has the same build as the man I saw at the garage before. That's obviously not definitive, but now I have more details about his description. I couldn't see before due to the lack of lighting and cameras. I'm still pretty shaky even though he didn't try to get in or anything. I was outside not half an hour ago, though I was in the fence backyard. I hope this isn't a lame update. It feels like it to me because... 
Still nothing is solved, and even though it might be unrelated, is this actually probable? That one person and or their house would attract so much trouble from completely different individuals? It doesn't seem likely. To the man outside my house tonight, let's never meet. Ah, here's something I forgot to add. This man saw the camera before he ran. I don't know if he would have tried more had he not, but it has a little red and blue light on the front part that rotates in a full circle, by the way. So, even I've noticed it. It's large and lights up a bit. That's why I thought they deterred creeps so far. I just forgot to put that in because I didn't think it was that important. One night, I was visited by the police, who very kindly didn't ring the bell. My parents were asleep, have been texted about all of this. I gave all the evidence, and they found the guy. I don't know for absolute sure it was the same man that banged on my garage or watched me from the window, but I do know that they caught this guy, and my video footage will be used, I guess? I don't know. I was really doubtful they'd actually send someone due to the chastising text messages. Now emergency was closed, lol, so I called the regular line. As I mentioned in an earlier post about this incident, my dad told me there had been a lot of car thefts in the neighborhood. Weirdest part to me, that I think I must just be fucking imagining, is that he looks from the somewhat fuzzy camera stills, quite a bit like a guy I had a one night stand with a couple months ago, right around when this all started. I really don't think it could be him, but I'm not hoping that since I'm supposed to get the ring footage to the officer tomorrow, don't have access to that one. I can ask who the person is. I'm hoping it's all over now and am so thankful for those who provided me with great advice, which gave me a lot of comfort. Unless I'm wrong and there is a second person, statistically unlikely, this will be my last update on a thankfully closed chapter. Several years ago, I suffered a small stroke, which I was lucky enough to walk away from at only the cost of many of my long-term memories. It fragmented that part of my meat hard drive to the point that I had to relearn much of my teenage and early adulthood life from photos and exposing myself to those people and places again. Sometimes my memories are spans of imagination to bridge the gaps. I remember my family in patches up to my teenage years, and not much happened between my second year of high school and my mid-twenties, with gradually more detail as I reach my thirties, up to my forties, where I have no problems. Sometimes it feels like I never saw the first few seasons of a television show in which I am the star. People just pop in like they were always there. It is often frustrating and it doesn't help that my experience makes me more prone to spikes of anger. I don't live where I lived those dead patches of my life, so... There are literal hundreds of people from that time who exist as other ghosts, abstract feelings, or not at all. I visit the hometown every so often to put flowers on my parents' graves and try to remember when and how they died. I keep in touch with my estranged sister, whose memories of family are fainted by her bad experiences and resentment toward our parents. My only window into that world is through my younger sister, who I wouldn't keep up with if not for our shared family. She lives in my old hometown, and our age difference is such that we knew many of the same people. Most of those people have moved away, but some planted roots less than a mile from where they grew up. For some reason, those are the people I know 
best through talking to them, even though they probably played little or no role in my life. People will approach me every way so often there, and in my own adopted city, and I'll have no idea who they are. People sometimes get mad at me for insulting them that way. I've had ex-girlfriends slap me and close buds walk off angry because they don't understand my situation. Some think it's a joke. Sometimes it is sad, but other times it can be downright scary. I was sitting in a pizza joint in the business district of Trenton, Delphia, working on something among the lunchtime crowd when someone sat down in the empty chair opposite of me. I looked up for my work and automatically began the process of threat assessment and identification. For me, it has become a practice. Usually, it's someone I know and I'll act like most people. If I don't immediately recognize the face, but they seem to know me, I will try to index them in my patchwork brain somehow. This was someone I didn't know, but might have seen many times. Older, 50s, male, stocky, grinning with confidence, leaning on his elbows, leaning forward, indicating acquaintance with me. The eyes are familiar. My index traces that to a feeling of unease. He's not an ugly person, but his gaze is severe. He wears a suit here like it's a costume because his posture isn't good for the cut of the blazer. That smile is not entirely pleasant, except that he's trying to make it seem so. This process took me about three seconds, which is just long enough to seem like an awkward pause because he says nothing at first. He just waits for what I guess is an automatic reaction. Now, I'm in a pre-COVID crowd, pressed in close enough to smell the entire menu and overhear a dozen life stories and woes, if I had the want to do so, so I'm not feeling threatened. But I'm feeling very uneasy. After a few more seconds, I actively stop blinking to see how long it will be before we start this conversation. He breaks and goes first. You don't recognize me, do you, Jimmy? His smile broadened, and I can't help but admire an expensive rack of teeth that I think might be more appropriate inside the head of a mule. The skin over his forehead wrinkles, carrying two plucked but pulp eyebrows along the slope. This helps me because nicknames are great context clues. My parents called me James. My colleagues and current friends call me Jim. My sister calls me Jimbo Dumbo because she's an asshole. <laughs> I'm sorry, you all. <laughs> I grew up in a household of all boys, me being the Otis. That happened all the time. Anyway, let's get back. Only people from back home in that gray zone of time called me Jimmy. My subprocessor brain keeps working. My face neutral. I reply with the usual. Sorry, no. I have a bad memory for faces. That fucking smile is trying to split his lips off his face. His eyes narrow to a severe degree, and they glisten with tears pressing out between the lids. He blushes hard, like I slapped him or something. It's honestly creepy, but proves my abstract memory of this clown is accurate. I didn't fucking think so, Jimmy. This is you now, huh? Not sure what to say to that. He's starting to hold himself together, putting pressure on his elbows and bringing himself closer to the center of the table with his bullet-topped crazy person face nearing the edge of my laptop screen. That flimsy barrier gave me a little comfort, but not much. This is me now? I'm in a suit minus the jacket that I left in my car. I'm 30 years old, 50 pounds, 
and a lifetime of experiences beyond whatever the hell he's thinking of as then. But seeing now he's wearing a suit that he probably digs out only for job interviews, weddings, and court appearances, looking like he's either seething or suffering from impacted bowel. I could easily dismiss the air of contempt in his statement. I am me as I always was, I guess. This was the best I could do while the brain meat worked to give me something to work with. He says, I didn't think I'd ever run into you again, Jimmy. I bet you hoped I never would. Ugh, fucker, I thought. I just told you I don't recognize you. Practice this in a mirror, did you? His face is not in my nightmare directory. He is not one of the dozens of images that I only see in those lucid dreams that mix fantasy with suppressed or fractured memories, usually about bad people or events, a breakup, losing my parents, a couple of bad beatings I suffered in school from students at the local clown college. But this wasn't anyone there. I heard you got sick. Did you have a breakdown or something? I said what I was thinking. Clearly, you're not an old friend. What do you want? Instead of spitting off his skull like a hot kernel of corn, his face suddenly went slack. His cheeks fell and his brow unraveled. The eyes, still narrow, softened to consider my response. Uh, I can't even tell if you're fucking with me, he said in a low grumble. He sat back and planted his palms on the table, eyes scanning the dusty rafters of the pizza place and whatever the hell he was on about. It was the way his right pinky bent against the tabletop that unlocked something in my head. It was bent at an odd angle. The ring finger was weird too. They had been broken a long time ago and not properly set. It was that and the phantom pain in my cheek and neck that connected the threads in my head. But not enough to give me a name or a place or a time. I just knew this dude was dangerous. When I get into those rare situations, I have to stab off a panic attack. It's a lot like arriving at work too suddenly, remember, you have a big presentation to give or that dream where you're in final weeks but you never attended the class. You smug, selfish asshole, he growled. His fingertips pressed down on the checkerboard tablecloth. If I saw you anywhere else, on the street, in an alley, back home maybe, behind the school, I would end you. That last part drew with it some ancient hatred that broke past the practice facade that he perfected in front of a mirror for probably many years now. There was something evil but honest on that face reflecting a truth in his heart about me. In front of me was a mystery from inside the dead space of my past. My face burned and I held my hands behind my monitor when they started to tremble. Something about this guy's face displayed all the bad men in my life that I'd forgotten. All the hidden dangers among the enemies I may have had and forgotten. It's like I'd slipped on a skin suit of some kind who died at 23. And while that kid may have met the guy and clearly not hit it off with him, the skin suit's current occupant had literally never met him before. Under less hostile circumstances, I would have tried to explain that my gaps were not chosen. I happened to remember a Thanos snap of memories from certain times of my life. I only know certain people existed in those gaps because I have a sense of object permanence that suggests they came to me from somewhere. All I could do was shake my head slowly, maintain eye contact, 
and watch for sudden movement. Aware that others were tuning in to our intimate reunion, the man worked to pack all his anger back into himself. It was hard, but he managed to put that toxic paste back in the tube and sat back. It gave me a better look at the old suit that fit him better ten extra pounds ago. The new tie that someone gave him, probably, maybe for whatever brought him into town. His face fell into an expression of disappointment, like this was a moment he dreamed of and it was wasted because of a dozen witnesses. Then he shot up out of the chair and left the restaurant. He didn't even order. I guess I sat there, lost for what I'd been doing in the first place, took my time to stop the trembling in my hands and the sparks in my head and made my way out to my car. I sat in the driver's seat, still frightened, not about what had just happened, but what I might have done to earn such seething hate from this stranger. A shadow crossed the driver's side window, and I looked up with a start. It was him. He stabbed a finger into the glass. The gesture felt familiar. He yelled, don't you ever show your face back home, fucker. I'll smack that fat right off of your face, you hear me? He pounded the side of his hand against the glass, but it simply trembled, about as much as I did. And he was gone. Surely, something so heinous would be in a police record, right? At least a tale told by people from around the town and place. I had no inkling of such a thing and no cool story to put a face to. Doubtful began to resent the fact I didn't have the uh, presence of mind to ask a single damn question before he bolted. That fuel made my damaged brain fire harder through the mess of memories and imagings, the based on a true story section of my head that tries to make sense of what I no longer witnessed. Greg. That name jumped out at me, complete with the extra G. Making it seem more real, the face was just a flicker and my need to get more forced me to not think too hard about it. Part of my coping mechanism is to assign values where none exist, making connections for the protection of my sanity, but at the cost of real memories. I have to distract myself from painting in memories and let that subconscious part of my mind work out the faces as best as it could. So I went back to work and made an appointment to meet my sister that weekend put flowers on graves, and find my old yearbooks. I wanted to go on social media and ask my friends from that time about the guy, maybe creep on their friend's page, looking for a grinning skull for a profile picture. That's a danger, too, as every new face that registers risks becoming a fictional version of itself. Something about boots... Or snow? These useless reports emerged early, but I was able to revisit them knowing the boots were important to me and that the snow was cold and hard. There was physical pain associated with these memories, too. I also started running my tongue over a chipped tooth for the first time since I could remember. I drank hard that night because... While I'm not supposed to, it kills my dreams. That weekend, I met my sister, who didn't recognize my description of a man 30 years beyond any memory she could have had of him. I asked her if I ever did anything so horrible that made a man want to kill me over. She replied that I made her feel like that a lot. Then... She asked me to borrow 50 bucks. I was much luckier over golf with a friend of mine who understands my situation and represents a good friend I lost. 
He is the custodian of many of my memories and helped me recover those first few years. We grew apart because, he says, I developed a different personality and was all about things in order and following instructions. We went square, he said, not registering the irony of calling it that. Do you know someone named Greg from our past who I really pissed off? I described him and explained the conversation we shared. Philip was doubtful, but it took a little while to consider it. As he did, I added my random evidence. A favorite pair of boots, wintertime, and the snow. Being thrown into it and chipping a tooth, maybe. Philip looked at me, and I could tell he knew. It was before I met Philip, but he had heard about it. I was 15. I got into a fight with some kid named Greg, or Greg with two G's who just came into the school from somewhere. He was, as Philip put it, a dick. Within a month, he had been expelled. Part of the reason, that was that he beat the living shit out of me. It wasn't important to Philip, so my old story about getting beat up on the walk home through heavy snow wasn't a big memory for him, but he remembered the part about the boots. It was winter, Greg had on old sneakers and a long walk home. We walked with another kid, a dropout called Clyde, who everyone in the neighborhood hated. Clyde and Greg were pretty much kindred spirits in their life-hating rebellion and love of violence. When Philip told me Greg beat me up for my boots and, maybe, left me to walk home in wet, cold socks, it did not jog a memory, but it made sense. We continued playing golf, and I lost six balls before I gave up on the fairway of the 15th. Soon after getting back to my motel, Greg Kowinski had a name and a face. Google filled me in on the rest. I wouldn't know about the boot story until much later, but Greg Kowinski was a convicted felon. He was also on the sex offender registry. I was, if not the first domino to fall in his life, I was the one that ensured they would begin falling steadily onward. Soon after he was expelled from school, Greg made up with the other troubled kids, including Clyde, and began selling drugs. Soon, he was trafficking and working in a warehouse that packaged and delivered large quantities. Along the way, he pursued his favorite pastime of meeting, using and abusing young women. He went to jail for beating a woman at a bar. He dated another woman and went to prison for a sex act with her underage daughter. With the doors closing behind him, Greg created an enemies list of all the people who wronged him. I know this because it was used in evidence to put him in prison again for stalking an ex-girlfriend. How he was back on the streets and his purpose in... Transadelphia remains a mystery, but I'm pretty sure I was, or am, on this list. One of many victims who walked home half a mile through snow in thermal socks and whose parents had Greg arrested for it. He knows where I live. I know this because he sent me a message on Facebook that was sequestered because he isn't a friend of mine or connected to me elsewhere. He quoted my address and added, See you sometime soon. That was over a year ago. I've logged down my social media since then, especially after he started liking pictures of my wife and sister. I hate going home alone now. I hate going to old haunts, even ones in public because I don't want to see his face. I'm at a point now where the gap in knowledge has narrowed to the point seeing him again may fill in all the details of the beatdown. Somehow, 
I think remembering it frightens me more than the risk of anything he would try to do to me. So, Greg, let's not meet ever again. This happened a few years ago when I was 20 years old in Hawaii. Now, I was raised being told there are creeps and murderers everywhere, so I always have a watchful eye out and even slightly paranoid. Well, to start this story, I started going to a small group run by the church I went to that took place Friday night near where I lived. We would meet at a courtyard in the middle of a busy strip-type mall. We were between a Jumba Juice and a Starbucks. In the courtyard there was a few tables around and one big table in the middle. We would always meet at that big table. One day I got there and noticed a man sitting at one of the tables more towards the back of the Jamba Juice building. He looked like he was in his 30s and was Hawaiian. I took no notice to him at first, but started getting an unsettling feeling when I started to notice he would not stop looking at me. When he was seated, any time I looked straight, I would see his face. Now, I've had the occasional creep try to talk to me, but there was something more intense about this guy. I never had a more disturbing vibe come from someone before. I tried to brush it off and enjoy the meeting. It was nearing to the end of the night and I started to take my keys out of my bag because I was planning on leaving shortly. When I did that, I noticed the man take his food and throw it in the trash and started gathering up his things. The sight of that freaked me out and I don't think it was a coincidence, because then he just stood there when I didn't get up. I ended up staying a bit longer because I was talking to one of the girls. I am about to leave, and I look up to see if the strange guy is still there, and he's not. I let out a sigh of relief and thought maybe he left. But I still felt uneasy, so I scanned the area. Now, he had the brightest pink shirt on, so he wasn't hard to miss. And wouldn't you know it, he was standing in the greasy area between the courtyard and the parking lot with his arms folded, just staring at me. I panicked inside and knew I had to have someone walk me to my car. I stood with my back turned to him, he was probably 50 to 75 feet away from me, and called the leader of the group over to me. I said, do you see that guy behind me staring this way? He has been looking at me all night and I don't feel safe walking to my car alone. Is there anyone, your family or someone could walk me to my car? She replied. Oh yeah, he's been here a while. He was there when I got here, which means he was there for three plus hours. She agreed that there was something off about him and she and her family walked me to my car. Thankfully, he didn't follow and I watched my rearview mirror the whole time home to make sure no one was following me. I made it home safe. I really thought if I walked to my car alone, something would have happened. I have never had a feeling quite like that before. But wait, there is more. A week later, I went back to the small group. I remember that guy and that feeling I had, but didn't think he'd be there. I go to our normal spot. I was there early, so only the leader and another woman was there already. As soon as I get to the table, the leader hugs me and says, I don't want to scare you, but that guy is here again. And I look over at the table he was at last time, and sure enough, there he was. I tried not to freak out inside, but I was totally freaked out. I talked with the girls while we waited on the rest of the group. 
In that time, I must have had an uncomfortable look on my face, and glancing in his direction, because both women turned around and looked at him. The older woman noticed that he had a clear view of me, so she scooched her chair to where she was blocking his view of me. Bless that lady. Well, that didn't stop this creep. He literally picked up the small table he was sitting at, moved it a few inches closer, and moved his chair to where he could see me again, all while looking directly at me. This is when I knew there really wasn't something right with this guy. The night went on, and at one point, the creep got a phone call. He went to answer it and started walking behind the Jumba Juice building. Before he disappeared completely, he arched his back so he could continue to look at me, and while he slowly made his way behind the building, creepiest thing I've ever seen. Needless to say, I kept an eye on him the whole night, and before I could even ask the group leader, she offered for them to walk me to my car again. I'm sure you were wondering if I ever saw that guy again. Thankfully, I did not. My cousin started baseball practice, and I had to take him Friday night, and ended up missing out on the small group night. I still wonder if he was there that third Friday, and maybe even the fourth, watching for me. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. I did go to the small group one last time a few weeks later. There was a few days before I left Hawaii. I was a little anxious, wondering if he'd been there again, and was relieved when I saw he wasn't. After that, I bought pepper spray. Moral of the story, if you feel uneasy, don't be afraid to tell someone. Maybe you think, what if I'm overreacting? And to that I say, even today, I know if I didn't have someone walk me to my car, Something would have happened. I was lucky I was with a group of people. But if you are alone and something like that ever happened, find a group of women or an authority figure and don't be afraid to say that you feel in your gut you're in trouble. It's amazing how much our gut feelings can be right about things. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elliott, Tina Mee, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continued support, for without you, there wouldn't be a me or a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you. For those of you who are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.